Well, not the circumstances that we'd like to be here on RJ Sanderson TV, but it is good to join you. It's a special edition today as uh, most of the country is unfortunately in lockdown. Roy Sanderson's with me. Roy, these circumstances, it's, uh, it's, it's terrible and it's uh, very frustrating. Great to be with you again, Dave. Uh, yes, very frustrating. Uh, Melbourne in lockdown, Sydney in lockdown, um, many states. It's, uh, it's, it's annoying, but it is what it is, isn't it? We just have to deal with it. The last time we were here, uh, Sydney was sort of in the first stages of their lockdown. They're now deep into, into their lockdown with no end in sight. Um, what have been some of the feelings that you've heard from the business community um, during the last four weeks since we last were on air? Yeah, well, there's a lot of fear out there that the lockdown will uh, be extended in Victoria for even longer terms, and that's, that's a real worry, especially given the very high numbers in New South Wales, and Victoria have to make sure that we don't get anywhere near those numbers. We've seen um, different approaches from the different state governments. Um, what, what are some of the, the learnings that you think have come out of the last few weeks um, as, as, I suppose, different sections of the country navigate this COVID crisis? Well, we know that we had cash flow boost and we had uh, JobKeeper. We also know we can't keep going back to the well for those sorts of dollars to get grants. So we've been relying on the state government to issue grants from time to time, and they're rolling out, um, and we're watching those very carefully. Uh, many businesses who did pivot to invent click and collect have had to get better at that and continue it. Um, I feel sorry for some uh, businesses that aren't that are, um, falling through the cracks as far as grants are concerned, and we'll talk a little bit about those later. Yeah, we're going to chat to a, a big guest again on RJ Sanderson TV, the Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Paul Guerra, to join us exclusively on RJ Sanderson TV. Let's get into our news headlines, Roy, as we do every time on RJ Sanderson TV and start with our economic indicators. And uh, viewers, let's uh, not sugarcoat this. The numbers aren't good today as we go to air. The consumer confidence is down 4.4% month on month, Roy, and probably not fully ref reflective of, of Victoria's lockdown, this number? Yeah, we're back to where we were in October or thereabouts last year, um, 12 months ago, and I think that we're going to see a, an ongoing decline simply because we're going to have more states in lockdown for the next uh, survey, and I think it'll get worse. And, and we, talk, we talked about the... the um the numbers that make up the Consumer Confidence Index um, previously, all of those indicators were down and they're things such as family finances and confidence over the next five years, um, whether it's time to buy a major household item, all of those indicators were down. And as I said, these numbers probably were based on people's perception of what a, a two-week lockdown in Melbourne was going to look like, um, not potentially what a you know, dare I say, a 12-week lockdown in Melbourne would look like with, obviously, New South Wales possibly in lockdown until Christmas by the, the way things are looking. And I don't know how New South Wales are going to survive if they're in lockdown until Christmas because businesses just don't have the money or the support and federal government, state governments are going to have to step up and I don't know how they're going to do that. It's going to be very difficult. And you mentioned um, that businesses aren't going to survive. Well, that's in, indicated in the numbers of, of, of business confidence as well. Have a look at this. Um, that first number that we see there, the negative six, is from August last year, and that was when Victoria started to see some of those really um, uh, high COVID case numbers and, and started to report deaths that were coming through aged care as well. And now, uh, 12 months on, the July number, negative eight, is, is a terrible indication of where business confidence is at. Um, and that's largely, as I said, based on the New South Wales lockdown, probably doesn't take into consideration the Victoria lockdown, the ACT lockdown, the NT lockdown that we've just heard about lately and the Queensland lockdown that's been, um, or that was, uh, that came about at the start of August. Yes, and I, to see those figures as bad as if they've been for a long time. And another, another stat that I don't think is going to get any better over the next few months and it's all going to come down to the, the timing of the lockdowns. But businesses are really doing it tough right at the moment. Let's have a look at some of... Or let, actually, let's have a look at the GDP growth rate. And um, this is not a new number, Roy. This is the number from quarter three 2021, March 2021, um, where the GDP growth rate is 1.8, which was down um, from the previous quarter. I suppose the big question to ask out of this is, is the country going to go back into recession? 
and what would a recession mean for Australia if we were to go back into recession? Now remember, a recession means that we have two consecutive months in recession, uh, in negative, negative growth, yep. and I think we'll have at least one. I'll be surprised if we end up with two, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that we're at least going to have one. With so many states in lockdown, we're just not going to have the GDP that we need. I think the one thing that we've noticed, though, with these recessions is that um, they're perhaps different to, to other recessions that we've experienced because what we do know is that as soon as places come out of lockdown, generally um, the economy recovers. And one of the questions we do want to ask Paul Guerra uh, later on in the show is with no government stimulus or less government stimulus being injected into the economy, is that going to change? Like, do, do we need to be more concerned about the prospect of a recession because people won't have the disposable income that they had coming out of the previous recession? They won't have that pent-up demand mm. where we, weren't, we were getting money but we weren't allowed to go out and spend it. So that was being built up in our bank balances until the lockdown was over. That's not happening this time around. Do you think the federal government needs to step in, Roy, at this stage and, and bring back something like JobKeeper? I'm not 100% sure. I, I'm not a policy maker. I think it is, would be good for business if they did, and I'm, I'm curious to hear Paul's opinion on this later. But uh, certainly I, I'm concerned that we've already borrowed so much money that it will be our children's grandchildren's grandchildren that will pay this back, and you can only keep going back to the well so many times. And I think we need to be very selective. JobKeeper, where they gave part-time people more money than they'd ever earned before, um, that was a mistake. Maybe we can make some slight improvements and make some changes this time around and be more directed at who really needs the money. Have we, have we got a reply from the, the Treasurer's office yet? No, no. Uh, Mr Josh Frydenberg, we continue to invite you onto the show. We've got some great ideas for you. And I, I know you watch the show, you're, just not, you're, not, you're too fearful to come on, that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Frydenberg. We look forward to, to you joining the show shortly at uh, some stage in the future. Melbourne restrictions tightened last night, uh, Royal will tighten as of tonight uh, in some instances as well. And the curfew's back, uh, what do you make of the new restrictions for Melbourne? Oh, I, uh, I understand them because we can't allow the numbers to get up to what uh, New South Wales numbers are, but hairdressers, beauty, gyms closed. Um, I suppose the biggest disappointing one is that uh, playgrounds are now closed in Victoria. And that's pretty hard to tell a little child that's uh, pent up at home that you can't go out and you can't get to a playground. I sort of understand the reason they did it, because there have been some children catch COVID, um, and there's a number of cases. I heard um, today over 20 children have COVID, and they're concerned that it's actually being um, caught at playgrounds, so therefore they're closing them down. I just hope it's not for very long, because children don't understand mm. the things that the adults understand. It's not Roy's rage yet, but I, I do want to say, say a little piece on that because from the outset of this pandemic, the focus was on older people around the world, you know, saving the elderly people and the older generations. And, you know, the kids have really been left behind on this. There's no uh, strategy towards how they're going to catch up with school. There's no strategy on, on how our education is going to be fast tracked. Are they going to, you know, have classes through summer or ideas on how they can better do online learning. And now playgrounds are closed. This is another blow for the younger generation who don't really have a voice in this pandemic either. And, um, you know, and then we also see the, uh, the vaccine supply issues that are affecting younger Australians more than older Australians. Roy, what do you think the pandemic would have looked like if the first message that came out of the pandemic was we need to protect the younger generation as opposed to the message that came through that we need to protect the older generation? I think the younger generation have been affected severely because of the variants that have come about. Um, in the early days, they weren't children weren't being affected, so they weren't the high priority. But the decisions that are being made today, I think will have an impact on generations to come because I can't see how children with the lockdown, less education, less exercise, um, will be the same as a generation but prior. There is support out there for, for people and for businesses. Uh, let's have a look at some of the grants available starting in Victoria. Uh, these are some of the, the grants that you want to talk through, Roy. Yeah, I just thought I'd mention this has been announced and up on the website in the last 48 hours. Um, it's important that your turnover has dropped by 70% and that um, in that time frame, you're impacted between the 27th of May and the 10th of September. Bear in mind, we're not at the 10th of September as we go live for this show. 
So you might still, in the next two weeks, have a decline of 70% and be able to apply for the grant. And um, I think it's just worth highlighting that uh, if you weren't in business in 2019, which is the benchmark comparison period, you can use other dates, so be aware of that. Um, critical also is that you must be registered for GST. I've had some clients in contact with me in the last uh, 48 hours in tears because they cancelled their registration for GST. Because of GST, they weren't earning over 75000 so they cancelled GST to make life a bit easier, and now they're going to miss out on $10,000. Uh, bear in mind there are some eligibility criteria that I've highlighted there, um, worth reading through. It's not dependent on your ANZIC code, um, but it is dependent that you didn't get an ANZIC code-related grant uh, recently, because you can't get both. I think the message there is pretty clear. Make sure you go and see your your financial advisor or tax agent to, to help you out with some of this. New, New South Wales also... Uh, Certainly affected. You can see some of the um, some of the rates there. Again, based on turnover, Roy seven and a half thousand for a thirty percent decline, all the way up to fifteen thousand for a seven seventy percent decline, um, and and similar sort of notes on eligibility as well. Um, that uh, people need to check their eligibility and and, and work through those uh, those steps there. Yeah, New South Wales. It's important to note there's different dates and different tiers. So it's in. I think that's not too bad. Victoria went with only 70% decline. Um, so, yeah, it's worth reading through those notes also because we've got many businesses in New South Wales as well. And the point here is that if you're a southern border business, we have an Albury office. Um, dates are different, so you need to be careful of that. And one thing that uh, will come up a little bit later, but New South Wales have a micro-business grant for those businesses not registered for GST, turnover between 30000 and 75000 and not eligible for any other grants. I mentioned before, a number of businesses have slipped through the cracks. Right here, New South Wales are trying to pick up some of those businesses without putting too many conditions on it. Roy, we've asked uh, for the Treasurer to come on and face the questions, but it's now time for you to face the tough questions here on RJ Sanderson TV. Time for question time. And uh, I'm going to start with one question here that is an interesting one. Um, it's got uh, tax connotations, but it's also related to the lockdown. Question one, to deal with the ongoing stress of COVID, I have signed up for a pay and paid for a mindfulness course. Is this tax deductible? A mindfulness course relates to your health and it's not related directly to the job you have or to improve your current job or current skills or knowledge. So therefore it's not a tax deduction. Even if you're doing this course because of stress, because of COVID, because of working from home, it still does not tie back as a tax deduction. So the answer is no to that taxpayer. I think that's one to put on the list to ask the Treasurer, see if we can include that on next year's budget. Question two, the government seems to be continually making the wrong decision and I've had enough. As such, I've signed up uh, as a member of another political party. Is this membership fee tax deductible? Membership fees to political parties are tax deductible, so you can claim them. Donations are also tax deductible, but only up to $1,500. Next question. I'm a casual hospitality worker with no income at the moment. However, when things open up, I will be looking to work more than full-time hours to make up for lost income. Is there a way that I can reduce the amount of PAYG income tax my employer withdraws in lieu of not having worked for large periods of the financial year? Possibly two options here. Uh, when With every employer, you fill out a tax file number declaration form. If it's a second job, they will take extra tax out. Don't tick it as being a second job and take the tax free threshold with both jobs. Another option is you could apply for a tax variation, have lower tax taken out, if that was approved all good and well. But remember, at the end of the year when you lodge your tax return, that determines how much tax you're going to pay or get back. So don't be too fearful about under-taxing it. I'd be more worried. I'd be worried if you undertaxed it and reduced it. Question four, the final question for today. How much tax on cryptocurrency do I have to pay as an individual? So it's important that cryptocurrency is included on your tax return firstly, because the tax office already know that you've been trading. They have those records. It goes down as a capital gain, um, and you don't get the 50% discount if you've been buying and selling. So on the capital gain, like any capital gain, whether it's shares, property or crypto, 
You pay tax at whatever your current tax rate is. So if you're on the 48% top tax bracket, over 180K, you'll pay 48%. If you're in the middle bracket at 34%, you'll pay 34% on your gain. If you make a loss, you pay no tax, you get no tax benefit, the loss carries forward until you make a future capital gain on either cryptocurrency, property or shares. Fantastic. Roy, you've done well with question time today. Now, we mentioned it earlier in the broadcast. Uh, it's a privilege to have our next guest with us here on RJ Sanderson TV. He's the Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and he joins us today. Uh, Paul Guerra, welcome to RJ Sanderson TV, and thanks so much for joining us again. It's a pleasure. Always good to be here. Paul, um, it's a, a troubling time for so many Australians and, and for so many Victorians. Um, what's the mood like uh, the, generally in the business community as, uh, as uh, we confront a, a, an extended lockdown period? Yeah, so we've been locked down now for uh, four, five and six uh, for the better part of three months. So, you know, it's fair to say yesterday's news was, was like the, the wrecking ball of COVID just hitting us once more again. So, you know, we dust ourselves up this morning. It's not a lot of uh, joy anywhere in the business community, but we know we've got tough two weeks ahead of us. And then hopefully with that, we can get back to doing what we love. But, you know, there's so many businesses out there that, that come Thursday are going to be more reliant on government funds than ever before. Paul, it's, it's Roy here. Thanks for being with us. Much appreciate it. I follow the uh, Vecchi very closely and I noticed you released something on some suggested lockdown protocols that I thought could be taken Australia-wide, not just for Victoria. Do you want to share those with us? Yeah, thanks, Roy. And look, we, we, we're always looking ahead as to these lockdowns don't get any easier, but is there a way we can be more certain in terms of what's going to happen with each lockdown? So after you know lockdown five was called, we thought there might be a better way here. Let's try something different. So I'll read them so I'll get them all right. You know, there are 10 points, as you talked about. The first is let's get more education on, on vaccines. Go and talk to your doctor or the government website. Um, and that's go and get tested. If you're not feeling well, go and get tested. And that's particularly pertinent right now. Second is let's move away from how many cases, let's move to what we can control. And what we can control is what are the test numbers like for the day and what are the QR code check-ins from every venue across the state. And we know, if we know what the QR code check-ins are, we can start to see patterns emerge. So if they drop off, we know that businesses or clients aren't doing the right thing. The third is the lockdown protocol. You know, if we're gonna lock down on the day, give businesses at least until midnight. You know, calling it eight o'clock was just crazy when we know most retail doesn't close until nine, doesn't give the hospitality operators a chance either. And I know some people will say you should go straight home. That's fine if you're not well, but if you have a booking and you're in the city, go take the booking and then head home from there. Um, we think a hundred kilometre limit for regional Victoria um, is about right. Let them go. So if there's no cases out there, just let them operate. Um, move to an LGA, a local government area scheme, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. Um, and with each of those uh, local government areas, not only for regional Victoria, but for metro uh, Victoria, if there's no cases and there's no wastewater um, showing up or no virus showing up in the wastewater, let's let those LGOs get out and free. Um, we think there should be more travel freedoms for vaccinated Victorians, right? There's no point getting the vaccine if you can't do much else with it. We think the time as we head towards 50% of the population having at least one dose, we think it's time to have that conversation. Um, we think let's start easing restrictions as less cases are detected, particularly in certain areas. So, for example, it seems a bit crazy at the moment that Mornington Peninsula is locked down. Right. There's no cases down there. Yeah, they're a long way from where the, the case load is in metropolitan Melbourne and equally Yarra Valley is the same. Um, where we do have high concentration, and we've seen that in the western suburbs, particularly in this one, let's get pop-up testing and a 24-hour vaccination hub out into those areas. Let's get as many people tested and then vaccinated as, as we can. Right. We think it's right that areas stay locked down until there's a number of days of zero community transmission. And then the final one, and this is really pertinent for where we are, an agreed business support package that can be stood up straight away with speed and with confidence so that the business know what's coming. So that's loosely the, the 10 point plan that we've come up with there. And obviously, if that can be adopted, it just gives a certainty that business will need. Paul, uh, you mentioned the LGA approach, which has been very unsuccessful in New South Wales, and the Berejiklian government has essentially uh, abandoned the strategy by putting the whole state into lockdown. Why does the Chamber 
support an LGA approach as opposed to a statewide lockdown approach, um, given the evidence has, has been that it's failed in New South Wales? Yeah, so there's definitely a difference with Delta. Um, what I'd say, though, is Victorians, unfortunately, we're well, well rehearsed at lockdown. So unlike our counterparts in New South Wales, we know the pain of it. They're living through the pain of it, and we hope they come out of that um, sooner rather than later. It relies on everybody doing the right thing. So if you're in a particular LGA, it's no rushing out to another area. It's stay in your LGA. You know, we don't want to see these last forever. We think Victorians do have an opportunity to actually do this in, in the spirit of what the lockdown is meant to be. And that's why we've got greater confidence in those LGAs being able to be locked down. We're seeing it operating in regional Victoria, so it can work. And we saw over the weekend, for example, that a number of metropolitan Melbournians, sadly, were trying to get out into regional Victoria. They were stopped being served in the, the regional LGA by the publican or the cafe owner because they knew they weren't from that area. So we think this has to be done on a, a spirit of trust we think Victorians have been through enough, and I think if we do it, we can do it properly. Paul, um, the government introduced a mentoring program that's been administered by Vecchi that we've been involved in, and I've really enjoyed it because I see businesses not only getting a little bit of uh, business support now, but uh, it's a lifelong education that they carry into the future uh, in their business or future business. Um, is that likely to be extended? Is it coming to an end? What, what's your knowledge on that government mentoring program? Yeah, thanks. We think this has been a great program and full credit to the state government for standing it up. Um, it was designed to do exactly as you talked about. You know, this about 12 months ago, we spoke to the state around what I was seeing is a lot of distressed business owners. And it wasn't just a mental health um, stress. It was a I'm not sure where my business can go from here. I'm not sure my business can survive. So we, we came up with a concept of actually putting a professional mentor like yourself with a business owner to say, here's how we think we can help you. And, and those decisions were varied from go and borrow more money through actually we think it's time for you to close the business or look for a buyer of the business or while you're in some downtime, you're going to be okay, but why don't you focus on what the future looks like? We've just about exhausted um, where we're at with the initial program. Um, we're speaking to the state government at the moment about an extension on it, and it looks highly likely that that will be the case. So for now, there's still spots open. So if you're interested in registering, please do come through www.victorianchamber.com.au, follow the prompts to the mentoring and register. It will be one of the best things that you'll do, particularly if you have a bit of downtime at the moment. 100% agree with you, Paul. It's been a great program. Um, I wanted to ask about, I know you support businesses of all sizes. There's a, in Victoria, there's a group of businesses, those that don't have GST registration, their turnover's under 75,000. They're, they're probably the struggle street. You know, they're earning between 25,000 and 75,000, not registered for GST, not employing somebody, um, based at home, might be a hairdresser, a lawnmower guy. They, so far in Victoria, have missed out on every single grant. And I just wonder, is there anything in the wind to put some pressure on state or federal government to support those smaller businesses? Yeah, it's and it's a great pickup because, you know, for a number of the business support grants, there were some of those falling through the cracks. We know that didn't occur to the same extent when JobKeeper was in, the, in place. That ended end of March. Um, the state government, we've spoken to them about it, and you'll notice in the last two support packages, they've stood up a small business hardship fund. And that is designed to pick up those businesses that may have slipped through the cracks for whatever reason. Um, we know the uptake on that has been good. It hasn't been excessive. So it means that the design of the overall package now from the state government seems to be hitting the mark. We also know that the federal government, through their worker support um, it's the, not quite the hardship fund, but it's a worker support fund there, is picking some of those up as well. So we know there should now, there shouldn't be any business really that is left behind through this, and there certainly shouldn't be any worker that's left behind through this either. So you know, we, we think the package is about right in terms of picking up all of those businesses and giving support for those businesses. You know, we could argue, is there enough money period in the, the business support package? And that's something we continue to talk to the governments about. What we're pleased about though, Though, is that we're seeing state and federal government come together to offer the right level of support for Victorian businesses. You know, as we all know, it's not the business decision to stop. 
It's a directive from the government to stop doing what we love in order to stop the spread. And with that, and because of that, it's only fair then that business are given some level of financial support in order for them to get through. Paul, I suppose um, traditionally um, some would argue that, you know, with a Labor government in power and, and the, chamber, the Chamber's interest being with business, that there could be a sort of jarring effect there. How's the relationship with the state government at the moment between um, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Victorian state government? Yeah, it, it remains strong. Um, we have strong relationships with um, all parties, whether it be the, the state government here, the opposition here, the federal government in Canberra or the opposition in Canberra. And look, you know, we're, we're not going to play politics. We're here for business. And, and ultimately, when the pandemic started, you know, my my background in business, you know, I learnt a lot and been lucky with a career that I've had. And, and one of the things that always came through with the companies I worked for was that collaboration wins. So we've taken a very collaborative approach um, through this. We understand the needs of business. We know we've been able to represent that back to government and they've listened. Um, equally, there's decisions that the government have taken that from a business side, you know, was probably difficult to understand. We've been able to explain those along the way, particularly in terms of business needing to stop to spread this uh, virus. It's not been an easy position for anybody to be in. I think we'll look back at it and there'll be, you know, certainly some highlights when I look at closing the border and the job seeker package, uh, the job keeper package, I should say, and of late. You know, particularly the combined support that's occurred between the state and federal government, I think there'll be highlights and they're things that we can certainly learn from. Yeah, you know, we want this to end, no question about that. And the only way it ends is when vaccination rates get to the level that we need to, and that's why we're really supportive now. If you can go and get the vaccine, please go and get it. We'll continue to be cooperative. We think that's the best way to serve our members. You mentioned uh, not playing politics, Paul, and, and being pragmatic, and I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. but. I think the reality is that we're on the verge of having to make some pretty ideological based decisions like what do we do with unvaccinated people and, and how do businesses manage unvaccinated staff? You know, how do you, how's the chamber prepared to, you know, to work through these issues in, in, in line with the state and federal governments as we move towards uh, perhaps some really hardcore ideological challenges into the future? Yeah, it's a great question. We actually called this in March this year that we thought it would be one of the biggest, if not the biggest issues to come out um, in 2021. Well, here we are and it will be. I mean, ultimately we need guidance from the federal government on this. It, it's unfair for business to be left isolated here to make the decisions and then face ramifications of either fair work or we're still going through a court um, process separate to fair work. So we, we need some clear guidance on this in terms of, of what will governments allow us to do, what the governments recommend us to do, and if they're not going to legislate, can they at least provide some you know, liability insurance to make sure that business is protected on the way through? We surveyed our members on this um, last week and some really interesting stats um, come out. So you know, let me take you through for them. For starters, the one that blew me away is, you know, the question was, do you support the introduction of greater freedoms from restrictions and entry to events for fully vaccinated people? 77% of the survey respondents said yes. 17% said no and 6% were unsure. In terms of would you like to be able to offer a COVID vaccine at, at your workplace, 35% um, said, said yes, 50% said no, 14% uh, was unsure. Um, this was the interesting one. Do you support the concept of mandatory vaccination as a condition of employment? Um, so there's two parts to this. The yes was 45%, the no was 22%, but the yes shifted from 45% to 74% for some professions. And there were 3% that was unsure. Um, and then we went into, you know, is your workplace offering any form of incentive to get vaccinated? 33% were saying yes, 20% were saying no, um, and blank was 45% there. So, you know, across the board, there's, there's varying degrees of support for vaccination, mandatory vaccination and not, which means that this will be a minefield unless we get some guidance um, from the federal government on this. And that, that's what we're pushing for now. We need it. It shouldn't be left to business or the worker for that matter to make the decision. It should be in the hands of the federal government to guide us here. Some strong leadership required. I agree with that, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Pleasure as always. Thank you. Paul Guerra, they're the Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Roy, uh, we really appreciate uh, Paul coming on the show today and some interesting insights there about um, not only 
how challenging it's been for businesses, but what lies ahead uh, with uh, some interesting compliance matters to, to sort of come in, in, in future months. And I love his protocols uh, for future lockdowns, which I think are just common sense going forward. This is one moment that uh, is usually full of common sense, uh, but it, it does get you fired up. It's time for Roy's Rage, uh, as we do every time on RJ Sanderson TV. Roy, what has been grinding your gears this month? Well, Dave, it's, it's actually quite a logical one because there's been so many grants out there, but I am disappointed that the small business person, the person who's not registered for GST, doesn't earn more than 75000 in turnover. He's a battler. He's trying to make a living. He missed out on all the grants that related to certain industries. He misses out on grants that related to um, businesses that employed people or those that were registered for GST. I'm talking about the hairdresser that works from home, the gardener or the landscaper. The guys who earn under 75000 not registered for GST have been left out of the Victorian grant system. And I see that New South Wales have given a micro-business grant for turnover between 30,000 and 75,000. And we need something similar to that in Victoria. I know there's a thing called Job Seeker, but they need a little bit more than that. They were in business. And it's the COVID and the lockdown that's causing them to have to close their shop. So yes, I'm a little angry about it. And I'd like Vecchi, I'd like state government, and I'd like business to put their hand up and say, these people need to be looked after as well. Whew. Scathing comments there from Roy Sanderson on Roy's Rage. Well, speaking of the business world, we thought uh, today would be a great opportunity to, to do something a little bit different on RJ Sanderson TV and have a bit of a business roundtable with a few representatives. And it's great to welcome our panel uh, today. We've got uh, Paul Worsling, we've got Bree Mansell and also Mark Heaney. Guys, welcome. Paul, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about your business firstly and what you guys do and, and, and how you've been impacted by COVID. Well, at present, we're very good at being closed. Uh, that's definitely been interesting. But look, basically, we sell fishing tackle and anything to do with going and catching a fish and getting out there and enjoying life. And um, people, a lot of people use fishing as a relaxation thing. It's good for mental health. It's good because you actually go and catch yourself a feed. So We've been closed well over 100 days in the past 18 months. And uh, look, everyone's in the same boat. Actually, everyone's not in the same boat. The best saying I've heard is everyone's in the same storm and all of our boats are different. But um, it's it's really interesting. The big boats are hurting too and the little ones. And um, I just feel so much for my staff as well, uh, literally on the bones of the inner wash. Paul, for uh, clients, customers to get hold of you and buy some something to do with fishing, fishing are you doing click and collect? Look, at present, we're not really click and collect because it's very hard. There's no job keeper. So I'd like to have two staff in the store just for security reasons. And by the time you pay two staff and then you sell $5 worth of gear in the day, you're just going backwards. That's the other problem we have. It's, it's easy to say, oh, click and collect, but business is actually about paying the bills and making money. So it's actually been easier to walk away and close the doors. And that is something that really hurts. I'm trying to give staff any hours I can. I had one in for two hours today, just unpacking some boxes at one of the stores. We do have online, ifish.com.au, but that's ticking along. The thing is with this five kilometre barrier, people can't really go fishing anyway. They're not inspired to go fishing. And, and I think the wind has just been knocked out of everybody's sails. So things are flat. It's really, really tough. Uh, Bree Mansell from Choice Energy, you're nodding your head there. Uh, are you caught in the same storm at the moment that Paul mentioned? Yeah, it's definitely an interesting one. Um, I agree with the sentiment that um, we are all in the same storm and are experiencing it differently for sure. Um, I've, our business has had to pivot multiple kind of different ways. Um, it's been challenging, but it's also been an opportunity to kind of figure out different ways about how we can be more efficient with our team and things like that. So I think there's been, a, there's been some pros and cons, but we're trying to get through it as much as, as best as we can. Bree, tell me, what, what do Choice Energy do and how do we get hold of you to help your business? Yeah, sure. So Choice Energy is an independent energy firm. Um, so the great thing about us is we operate nationally in New Zealand with more than 4,000 clients. Um, and it's our focus to help businesses and homes reduce their energy costs through a range of solutions such as commercial solar, residential solar, energy procurement services and a, and a real uh, collection of other services and solutions. Um, and you can find us online searching Choice Energy on Google. But essentially um, how I guess businesses can help us, the, the great thing about that is that, you know, in, in 
the ability uh, to help us, we can also help businesses and homes. So if, if we can provide a service, you know, a complimentary energy assessment and identify some savings, it's a great outcome for us and a great outcome for businesses and homes too. Mark Cheney from Mac Electrical Services. You're in the you're in the the Ute at the moment. It looks like. Um, yeah. Are you, yeah, I'll fall over. So you, you you're you're still able to operate uh, under the, the current lockdown conditions at the moment. Yeah, we can. We've got a workers' permit system that we can go to certain projects. We we're not allowed to go to people's homes or do any domestic work though. And how, um, and, and how have those? Uh, how has that that affected your business? Yeah, well, we find it works, even though we're classed as essential service and, and so forth, and, and a lot of people think that we're electricians, so we must be busy. But we've found it very patchy, so there's a lot of uncertainty out there in the community and especially in the domestic, but all around there's investors that aren't investing anymore and, and they're simply not doing the projects that they used to do. So whatever work is available is now spread across a broad range of people that are all trying to chase that same work. So it's become very, very competitive. And um, you were finding find there's just too many gaps in the in the market for us at the moment. So we, we're stop, start, stop, start at the moment. Mark, if a, a customer wants to use your services and support um, a, a fellow client, where do you work and how do we get hold of you? I pretty much work anywhere in Victoria. Um, we we do a lot of shop fit out, so that's where we get our travel from. We we travel all over the place doing those sorts of jobs, um, and that's for for common clients. But we, yeah, we um, mainly we've started a, a starting a website at the moment, which is MacElectricalServices.com.au, um, and basically that's probably the best way to start getting hold of us is to start looking at that, and. Yeah, we, we just um, we travel everywhere. We we're not rich, actually sort of stuck to one area. Um, I'm on my way home from Warren Ponds at the moment, the other side of Geelong. So um, we do do quite a lot of projects all over the countryside. Guys, before we let you go, I want to go through the panel one more time and ask you if there was one, uh, I suppose, thing that the the state government could bring in to help your business, what would it be? We'll start with uh, you, Paul. I think it's probably an obvious one for you, but uh, what would it be? I think we need a crystal ball to know what the future holds. That's the hardest thing, the uncertainty. But look, you just your staff need to be looked after, number one, and small business needs to be looked after, number two, because... Small business is the heart and soul of our community. It just it just grows from the small business. And if we fail, if we go down, then the whole economy goes down and Australia disappears with it. And that's what we need, that help. Certainty would uh, would absolutely help the situation, I think, for so many. Um, Bree, what about uh, for, for Choice Energy? What would be uh, one thing that would help your business? Yeah, it's a really good point. I, I'd probably kind of second that um, I've really, really felt for um, other small and, and medium sized businesses and entrepreneurs out there. Um, so any any additional support to those groups of people, um, those little pockets, um, you know, that have been really affected by this, um, you know, we've got to try and hopefully get through this next little bit so we can all start getting on with it and, and back to work and um, and getting back to, you know, the great city and country that we are. Mac Electrical Services, uh, perhaps in a slightly different boat, Mark, but any closing yep. thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I agree with what Paul said. They're, our staff are the most important thing and small business across the country is, is sort of supports the economy. So I think the JobKeeper program gave us a bit of hope that we would survive. Um, and since that's not there anymore, it's, it's just not quite the same hope. So something like that sort of program would probably be beneficial. Paul, Bree and Mark, thank you so much for joining us uh, on RJ Sanderson TV and all the best uh, navigating this uh, lockdown six. Thank you very much. Thank you. Roy, uh, some interesting thoughts there from, from business owners and, and we also obviously had some, some great insights there from uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Paul Guerra, before. Uh, any closing thoughts from yeah. you? I think the message from the, the three business owners was we need more support for small business. I agree with that fully. Um, I think in Paul's case, I thought his, his uh, response might have been open up fishing. Uh, I should be able to go fishing with my partner, my mate, in small groups. I'm not talking about 10 and 20 people, but at least go out fishing and open up golf courses and have two in a pair and social distance out in the open, get some exercise and open up life again. So that's what I would be asking state government to do. It's interesting how uh, 
all, all three of the business owners there, they, they didn't necessarily say they wanted an amount of money or a handout. They said they just wanted some certainty and some clarity. And I think that that is one of the most challenging aspects of this is that um, I, I know there's the cynical joke doing the rounds on WhatsApp at the moment. Have you heard um, what the hardest part of a three-day lockdown is? No, I have not. It's week three, apparently. Um, that's that's the that's the the joke. But I think um, you know the the idea that there's a lack of certainty in the community is, is something that everyone is really um, struggling to deal with, and um, it's unfortunately I think um, you know one of the things that is not going to be able to be given to people anytime soon because there will be, you know, I don't want to be the, the pessimist in the room, but there may be new variants, there may be new challenges as we roll out the vaccine and, and we see that, um, you know, that, that potentially, you know, that um, people in the community are hesitant to get it. So, you know, there are going to be new challenges and we're all navigating this new world together. So um, I think that one of the messages that Paul... Um, that Paul gave was that businesses need to work very closely with the state government, keep providing that feedback, keep that feedback loop going so that state government and federal government are aware of the challenges and can, um, and can develop legislation that, that helps them and, and is, not, um, you know, is, is not just developed by bureaucrats with no understanding of, of exactly what the landscape is. Uh, I, it's very interesting that we do this show once a month and what changes can change and has been changing every month is quite extraordinary from month to month. Business confidence well down, consumer confidence well down. Now, by the time we do this in September, Roy, I'm not confident that it's going to be an increase, but uh, we will be back in September and we will look at those numbers and we do appreciate everyone's time watching today. Roy, thanks so much as always for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks, David. Have a great day. And thanks uh, to everyone for watching online here on the RJ Sanderson Facebook page. If you do have uh, your tax matters that haven't been resolved for FY21, make sure you jump on the website rjsanderson.com.au and book in an appointment today. Thanks so much for watching RJ Sanderson TV. We'll see you next time.